Hi, this is Steve Carlson, and I want to talk to you about leadership in Washington. This is about leadership questions in Congress during the impending fiscal cliff of another Obama debt ceiling contest. Those are coming up. There are some key issues. I believe that in November, there have been some unusual measures that are keeping the government going that the administration says are going to run out. There are issues. This is about leadership. The issue has been raised. What kind of leadership do we need in the House of Representatives? And I would add in the Senate with Mitch McConnell. Currently, John Boehner is still hanging in there as Speaker. He made a false move pretending he was going to resign, and he put up his lieutenant, Kevin McCarthy, who was immediately undercut by Hillary Clinton with her email stuff. And McCarthy withdrew. And back comes Boehner. Boehner's in there, apparently. He's going to be there during this entire thing. You're going to have Boehner and McConnell. Now, I think that's kind of dishonest. He unilaterally, uh, unilaterally rescheduled a vote on his own office. And I think he was trying to draw out the opposition and see how he could continue to work in that office and help his friend Barack Obama. They're making deals, and the effect of one deal has already appeared. Mitch McConnell has said briefly on Facebook, it was said of Mitch McConnell, that he was trying to make a deal to both cut Social Security and raid Medicare and do something about the coal regulations which affect his state, Kentucky, in an exchange for raising the debt ceiling. Now, Obama's already put the COLA, annual cost of living adjustments, cuts into effect. Currently, unless Congress takes action, millions of the participants in Medicare will see their premiums in Medicare rise by as much as 52%, while everybody's COLA is being cut out. And since they often pay that out of their Social Security, it's going to be a hardship for many older Americans. And I don't think the Democrats probably would have been wanting to vote for that. But Obama went ahead and did it. And it shows the lack of sincerity and concern for those on fixed income in this economy. Many of us are in the workforce trying to supplement Social Security so that we can have a chance to live a decent life. And Social Security and Medicare is certainly one of the hallmarks of the Great Society, I guess, or the New Deal, actually. And it's being undercut, manipulated by somebody who has no respect for American values, trying to damage, really, the country and doing no good for anybody. So that's already gone into effect. And there are still some issues regarding the debt ceiling. So the debt ceiling is a big issue. Last time we got into this in 2013, I did create the rap to the mountaintop. Well, more and more people have fallen further from that mountaintop. Obviously, the politics of Obama are far from those of MLK, Martin Luther King. He doesn't want dignity and judgment and character. He wants to attack the foundations of our society. Because while he's not leading a union of sanitation workers, garbage collectors, like King was, and that's certainly a noble thing to do for King, and now he's got people who won't do the job and have to live throughout their lives on a system of entitlements. And this is a sad situation. We would have hoped that Obama might do something about this. Well, he blames the Republicans. But this blame is not well-founded. Obama does not understand nor respect American values. And Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton have indicated recently that they are fine with not only an entitlement-based society, but actual socialism, democratic socialism. And I'm not talking here about the insurance programs, even though people can make arguments against the way that's conceived. But this insurance money for Social Security and Medicare is truly money that people have been paying all of their lives. And had they kept that money, had they had it, uh, we don't know. This is the issue of privatization of Social Security. We don't know they may very well have done better investing that, perhaps, or by some means to save rather than to borrow at high interest rates. And so rather than just pretending that they should only get every dollar back, we need to, by some means, ensure that we can achieve the goals for which the money is being collected by the federal government. And clearly, what's being collected by the federal government is being used for other purposes, basically for cash flow purposes for the federal government 
and to help finance the debt service the U.S. owes just on debt, existing debt, not even including future obligations. These are debts already incurred, and I know George Will said today that it's about $283 billion this year. This is debt servicing, just interest on the debt. So if you take that over 10 years, like they like to do, I believe that would be over $3.5 trillion just on debt service of current debt. And that's because it keeps climbing every year. And I want to turn that around. Stop the borrowing of money and you know, slow it down, transition it out, and start to pay that down. But currently, I think it's on track for $3.5 trillion. And that is hurting us in terms of creating both deficit and debt. So this then is the big issue that we face in really what is another fiscal cliff. Obama blames the Republicans, but he's been a series of fiscal cliffs. And there are a lot of issues with both many of the Democrat and Republican constituents. They're all basically trying to pursue their own self-interests. On the side of the Democrats, you have unions who are attempting to maximize their pay, their wages and benefits. And that really has already driven one of the keystone industries of the nation into failure. That is our auto industry and our government takeover, not to help get the health benefits uh, which were burdening the auto industry down, perhaps work with employers. But of course, the Democrat interest in health care, Obamacare, is not really to help the economy or those who need health care, but create jobs and promote their social objectives, like abortion and the like. Next, it will be AIDS. Uh, some of the states have already tried to put paying for AIDS medication into abortion, I mean, into abortion, but into the uh, Obamacare. They, they wanted to start to uh, pay people out of that, out of their exchange and out of their medical program. In New York, they wanted to pay people uh, AIDS uh, medicine. Now, I'm all for them getting medication, and I wish them the best, but to impose this burden on all the people of the country, I think, would be uh, very damaging. We have to take another approach to this. And so the unions on the left did things like work with Obama to impose the so-called stimulus program back in 2009, which here in Minnesota is just causing this great shift of our transportation budget to building new light rails around town. And the unions love that, and yet it is very destructive locally. Uh, this is taking uh, all of the budget into the metropolitan area, much of it overwhelmingly into the metropolitan area, to pay for light rails instead of statewide. And it focuses the budget on mass transit while hurting our ability to even maintain our bridges. And I walked on a bridge as I composed this. And one of our favorite favorite bridges has collapsed, famously killing nearly a dozen people several years ago. And we have all kinds of bad roads and bad bridges all around the state. And this is because of the approach of the federal government imposing a stimulus, so-called stimulus program, which really was a punch to the gut, not a stimulus. And so this is the issue that we face. It's an issue of philosophy. It's an issue of e efficacy of the ability to do something about the current situation. So as we look at our current debt obligations, pushing up against the ceiling, we've got this leadership problem. And the problem is that this is an elections problem. And that is because the members of the House, all of whom will face re-election next year in 2016, still won't act. We've come to the point where they've been painted into a corner so they admit, it's admitted that they can stop the continuation of Boehner by replacing him with Kevin McCarthy. They can stop that. But then what? Now, here's what both Boehner and McCarthy are saying. We're not rhinos, they're saying. We really want to oppose this manipulation of the debt and deficit by Obama. But we are stuck because we don't have the White House. But you know, with the election coming up next year, we're actually well into the nomination process, and it appears that their establishment candidates are going to cave. It's the rhinos, if you will, 
which means Republicans in name only, uh, not really having the care and concern about maintaining the freedoms and liberties that evolve from utilizing our full capacity through utilizing the free market and true job creation and true advancement through education and building more effective communities and families. This is really what the rhino position is, and it's fine. Uh, and it hasn't changed. It's a good position. And the Tea Party people support this. But what's changed is the failure of the political system, really of the two-party system, Republicans and Democrats, so that there's long been an issue about how inequalities could be addressed. And as George Will seemed to agree with me today in his column, in the Democratic debate in Las Vegas, inequality was addressed as the rich uh, really uh, trying to determine what to do, what they, how they could share a little of their wealth. And Bernie's talking about free education. Hillary's not talking about anything. She's playing the cards close to her vest. Who knows what Hillary would do? She'd get together with Bill and figure out how to play the cards what their next ambitions were. But now, utilizing gender quotas, gender baiting, and gender politics to try to get Hillary in the White House. And this is killing America. These guys are killing us. And they're supporting a lot of other things that are killing us too. And they're not showing any leadership whatsoever. And so the question is then, what is the approach? How do we address these? How do we address the issue of equality, fraternity, and liberty, if you want to use the ideas of the French Revolution. But our revolution was different, as I explained in my critique of the Democrat debate in Las Vegas. In France, they've never had, well, they've got six constitutions they've gone through, different regimes, different revolutions, because they've really never moved too far from the monarchy. Monarchical systems, kings, queens, mostly kings, who had absolutist authority, could not be challenged, and so everything rested with them. And the people could try to address them and address their issues, but they were lucky if they were able to keep any private property for themselves, any rights for their families. And so the church long played an important role in protecting those rights. Well, our revolution is better than the French Revolution. Equality, fraternity, and liberty. And of course, fraternity wouldn't be acceptable in today's America. And why is that? That's because we have put in the legislature's hands from the ground up the ability to create a state. And the franchise, the vote, has been extended to women. And basically, it was the ability to continue a state of 13 colonies that had done rather well in many ways, had been prosperous, and had enjoyed, together with England, the benefits of the Industrial Revolution, as well as the trade in the Americas. And so, we put the power in the hands of those people, people that would uh, have effective power, where they could have the rights to decide their future and to protect their own individual rights. This is something you don't have in France. You don't have individual rights. You have certain rights, legal rights. Their legal system is quite different. And uh, that's important. They don't have the so-called adversarial system or proceedings uh, in their courts, where the court really plays no role except to decide who won. In America, the United States, it's sort of like your, your refs. The judges are like refs in your weekly NFL football games. You go out there and play in court and try to score touchdowns, but the referees, the judges, control the ball game. Now in France and most of continental Europe, they do rely on a court system that clearly defines rights of the litigants. And so the responsibilities of the government and all a lawyer really needs to do there is to know what the law is and present that to the judge. And the judge is obligated to give effect to their substantive laws. In our country, the judge has no obligation to give effect to our laws. If you do not engage in the adversarial process that was made available to you, if it was, it's your duty to put before the judge that he uh, things that he or, or, or she agree establish your rights to that remedy. Well, in France, that's taken care of from the facts of the case. It's called the civil system versus the adversarial system, which we brought over from England, common law system. Now, why is that important? 
is important because we're working without a net to some degree. We can pass all the laws we want. The problem is the courts don't have to enforce them, and they usually and often don't. And you might see a beautiful case once in a while in the Supreme Court, but that's ignored unless you're the rich or powerful. Then you'll get a judge to go along with what the Supreme Court said, unless they can come up with something else. While over there, in Europe, the parliaments are in charge. And uh, if they, they want to shift to a different political system, different government, they can shift the government on a moment's notice for a vote of confidence. Here we have to wait till the next election. This is where it becomes critical. This is what we're in now. And the way we've got it set up, we've got three elections that really have to be gone through, as we're painfully going through now, uh, before any real shift in power can occur. And we're in one of those cycles, Obama versus, and his Democrats versus the Republicans. And we need to get out of this. We're in a cycle where the Democrats can stonewall, they can sandbag, and they can prevent the government from taking effective action to fulfill its obligations, such as paying our debts. And then basically, it's a system of demagoguery in the Republican, in the, well, certainly in the Democrats. Uh, there's some demagoguery in the Republicans, but basically, the government is based on demagoguery by the Democrats, a well-organized system of proportional representation in delegates that elect the president and elect members of Congress. And you can have primaries that can try to override these big state conventions where the Democrats have their proportional representation. Um, however, it's very difficult to do. In our state, Minnesota, Mark Dayton was able to do it because he's a wealthy skier. So he used his own money, like Donald Trump, to basically buy his, his way into the Minnesota government. He actually did not get the endorsement. It went to a woman. Uh, because she benefited from the gender quotas, and he just uh, went outside and paid a lot of his own money and got himself the uh, nomination in a primary, and he got elected governor. So this is the problem that we're working with. We have to work our way through these politics in order to be able to take responsible decisions for the American people. And the problem is, even if we do get majority of Republicans weren't by no means insured of getting responsible decisions for the country. Instead, what we're doing is going back and forth from one extreme to the other. So this proportional representation is what was sought as soon as the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965. Within three years, you had the Democrats losing badly after a fracas in the Chicago Convention, which is famous to a lot of today's voters. And with Mayor Daley and the riots and all of this, uh, police attacking the demonstrators for sure, and the demonstrators attacking the police, no doubt, a lot of people. And that happened just three years after the Voting Rights Act. By that time, they'd already discussed getting this proportional representation. And what I mean by proportional representation is if there's more than half women, they want to have more than half of the government. They want to have more than half of the Supreme Court. That's proportional representation. It's not proportional representation between the Democrats and the Republicans and the independents. That might be another idea, because there's so many independents right now, where 53% of the voters are uh, either outright independents with 45% or another 8% are with third parties. So that kind of proportional representation might work. But this is demographic representation which a proportional representation, which is supporting a demagogic system of government uh, led by the Democrats. They're a tidal wave. And I don't think that the Republicans really have an answer for this. And they're not serious. And we need to get serious. And independent voters this year are serious. We're not waiting for the Republicans. And that's the message of Donald Trump, Ben Carson, probably even Carly Fiorina. And on the Democratic side, is even the message of Bernie Sanders. We are the independents, and we don't, we've seen this show before, as I said, and we don't want to see it again. We want to take over and change things this year. But that's what proportional representation has led to. And so I want to explain to you how we got it. Um, they had already started discussing proportional representation 
in the United States Supreme Court. In Mobile, uh, that is to say, Bolden versus the city of Mobile, Alabama. It's about the city council. And it was led by Thurgood Marshall, the first black justice. He was appointed by Lyndon Johnson, who apparently did a lot of things badly. Uh, he's a Democrat, and his vice president, Hubert Humphrey, was here from Minnesota. As I've, I've said in some of the other videos, he aced out Eugene McCarthy, who did a lot of work and got a lot of support for the Democrats, and then Humphrey stepped in at the end and he blew the election. But now on the courts, Thurgood Marshall was already uh, saying, as this court read its position, the, the, uh, the United States Supreme Court understood its position in that opinion to say that minority groups have a right to proportional representation uh, according to their presence in the population to virtually every office. So that's what their goal is. And it's working out very badly. And this fiscal cliff is no time to be playing proportional representation, and yet here we are. So uh, Marshall's concern was the city council of Mobile, Alabama. But now these proportional representation rules have been implemented. They've been implemented in Minnesota. And nationally, they went through the McGovern-Fraser Commission, as I discuss in my case, which is currently pending before the Supreme Court in the United States. And they eventually put in those requirements. And so it is a demagogic party nationally that is systematically constructed to exclude the freedom of the vote. It suppresses the vote, suppresses white votes, male votes, straight votes, to skew the federal elections for Congress and President. And Barack Obama said in 2012 it was very, very important to him that in California and all these other states they follow this uh, quota system. And it even had 12% of the California Democratic uh, State Convention had to be homosexuals. This was very important to uh, Barack Obama. And that's not democracy. All right, now this dysfunctional federal government, stymied by quotas and demographic politics, rather than American politics, is important as we approach yet another fiscal cliff. As uh, he thinks, uh, Obama thinks, is, he's smartly playing the lone wolf Barack Obama. And the issues now are how do we address some of the dangers which this guy has uh, created for the country. This includes messing up a war uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan so that we now have these guys over here, the ISIS people, rather than over there. They're committing acts of terrorism and furthermore messing up the defense against Iran. Now by pulling out of the war and creating all of this barbaric chaos, savages from a past age, really, this has put a great deal of pressure on Europe and on the United States. And so somebody has suggested that we should not raise the debt ceiling unless we have an agreement not to bring in potential enemies to overthrow our government through the plans of the Obama regime to try uh, to bring in people like him that will line up against the American people, our police, our military, etc. To create yet unrealized levels of chaos and destruction and insurrection. And that seems logical, except that it would be tied to our, national, our financial stability. And this guy, Obama, would use that not only politically because of the rather moronic mass media who had joined to blame everybody but him, but he would use it to destabilize us financially and economically while he is pouring in enemies of the country and creating chaos all around the world. And recently he said that some people are suspicious of him, and he attributes that to their religion. And this seems to like yet another off-the-wall comment by Obama, the Democrat, representative of the Democratic Party, currently uh, running his ally, Hillary Clinton, and another socialist, Bernie Sanders. And it seems rather cryptic. We're suspicious of him? You know, there are certain policies and intentions that he sets out. And the question now is, can the Congress act on or against those policies and intentions? Or will they sit there like weeping and basically acting like a lot of prima donnas. And I think that they are doing the latter, except for these people who say the uh, 
Tea Party people, the uh, Freedom Party people, wait a minute. We believe in representative form of government. We don't believe in hierarchical rule. Obama, this is supposed to be some kind of king. He's your liege, and you are his vassals. John Boehner and Mitch McConnell, and you will get, oh, I suppose, some land, uh, some kind of titles of nobility, if you go along with your liege. Well, this is not America. This is not even as good as modern European parliamentary systems. And here, uh, we already know that because of their access to the media, uh, they, the importance of presidential elections, these presidential candidates versus myriad others elections that occur at the same time. And we also know basically the rather simple-mindedness and shallowness of our population because they don't know what to do in this complicated system to oppose destructive acts to the country. And so Obama feels he has a lot of power in these negotiations on the fiscal cliff. And he's created this hierarchical rule. And so the reason, as I've suggested, that we must not allow this but revert to what, for instance, John Freery of The Hill spent to, uh, tweeting to me. He's formerly a staff for Dennis Hastert uh, as a former speaker. And supposedly he speaks from experience. And Freery says, we don't want regular orders where our elected representatives are allowed to bring amendments to the actions suggested by committees to the floor so they can be debated. And so what's brought to the floor by the committees can either be modified or rejected and sent back to the committee. We're not allowed to do that now. So all of this election fanfare is basically negated. It's void. This is a way to negate the effect of the first federal election I participated in as a member of the Minnesota Independence Party in 2010, when we shellacked Obama. And then he was shellacked again in the last election. But in between, there was scandalous, really betrayal of America by a lot of special interests, who Obama was able to get to vote for the first time. Fools, foolish people who voted against their country and its security and have betrayed us, and now we face yet another fiscal cliff. And I have to say, we have two of the goofiest senators in history in Minnesota, and Amy Klobuchar, who got elected by gender quotas, and Al Franken, who is basically a professional goofball. He's worked the Playboy Club, Saturday Night Live, uh, all these other places where a Harvard graduate might stop on their way to the bottom as to a failed life. But these people are basically sitting by waiting for marching orders. Not leaders, not senators, but professional goofballs. So we're at the edge of this fiscal cliff once again. And as I say in my rap, I think we'd better turn around and get off the cliff. I think we need a tune-up and a strategy shift. But how are we going to do that? So this man, not only does he hit us for taxes, but he puts the sword to our neck by threatening our national security by playing with the bodies of the unborn, the undead, because they're supposedly not alive yet. And so many people want to attack these issues and not the process. And that is understandable. And we know if uh, that probably the moronic and treacherous, traitorous media, talking heads and scribes who write all kinds of nonsense, they will cheer on what they think is a new history over that fiscal cliff. Now, they're supposed to be journalists. They're pretending they're historians, that they don't need history to study. They make history, or they write bad journalism, and their history is bad history. And so we don't want to just blame them, however. We have to focus and restore this con Congress. McConnell must go. He's extremely dangerous, and he's just not prepared for this. He's trying to cut deals to help his home state of Kentucky, where what you have is an entire nation that is at risk because of his policies and actions. And also, Boehner's got to get out. And so I don't know that there's enough strength in the Senate to force McConnell out. We know he and Boehner will simply call for a clean so-called bill to raise the debt limit. Who knows what it's going to fund? Those should be some of the issues. All of this. All of this needs to be debated on the floor of the Senate and the floor of the House and in conference committee and in front of the people. We need a representative democracy to work. 
It needs to work right now. And now is the time. We've seen the silliness in the Democratic debate in Las Vegas. They show they have no credible plans for anything and that Hillary's going to be elected because of her sex. She thinks that's exciting. I'm sure Bill Clinton thinks it's exciting too. He always gets excited about sex. And this way, he won't even have to be in the White House and in the unfortunate eventuality she is elected, we hope their marriage will stay together. But for now, we need to pay serious attention to the serious state of our country and adopt regular orders that let our representatives give voice and let the people see the discussion, not in closed rooms of smoking, crying, hierarchical bosses. This is Steve Carlson. I'm running for president, and I approve this message.